here is our canvas pad. This is a 10 sheet um, of 12 by 16 canvas pad uh, sheet of paper that we're going to be using for our preliminary uh, acromatic grayscale as well as our color wheel. And again, it's not about in terms of how we can measure the color wheel, but it's really within looking at um, this as almost a sketchbook. So I sort of ripped off the first page, the cover page, and that sort of textured canvas paper is really easy to use. I would like for us to use this in a preliminary painting. So if you're thinking about what you want to make on your, uh, on your painting, this is the sort of preliminary sketchbook. Now remember, because this is a painting class, I want us to get into the language of painting when we get into our actual paintings without using any graphite, without using any pencil, any pen, and really understand how do we use a brush? How do we use some of the materials so we can make some of our paintings? Let's talk a little bit about that. So I have a series of brushes, okay? I have a number eight. This is a round Bristol brush. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about in terms of the differences between Bristol and synthetic. Here is a fan brush. This is the synthetic fan brush, which looks like this. Hopefully you guys can see the quality. It almost looks like a plastic material, okay? Here is a Bristol brush. It's a lot more hardier. It could hold a little bit more paint and it's much more rougher, okay? It almost feels like um, sort of thicker, um, sort of bristly, harder, uh, almost sort of uh, textured material, but that's also um, going to be uh, depending on the sort of preference of what you want to uh, purchase in terms of mater your materials. This is a, a round uh, number 16 that you can use. This is obviously a synthetic. You can obviously see if I push a little bit of pressure, it starts to, ex starts to expand. Okay. Here is a round number four. And these are all numbers that you can get, whether if it's at the art store, I have, do have a list available on the uh, supply list, as well as the course syllabus that you can get. You don't need too many brushes. You probably only need four or three, to be honest with you. I don't want you guys to go buy a whole pack, okay? I know brushes can also be extremely expensive. So I, that's another thing to consider. Here is a Bristol round. You can kind of see it's much more sort of uh, rough around the edges. And what I like about this is that you can make uh, textures when if you're sort of splitting off some of the edges within some of the paints that we can use for either splattering some of the uh, colors that we can use for texture, but you could also sort of make series of sort of textural marks depending on the direction of your paint of how you apply it on your uh, uh, surface. Um, these are some of the examples of some of the brushes you could use. You could use any. There is no right or wrong brush, okay? But just remember when you go to any store, any art store, just re remember that we're working with acrylic, so you want something that's acrylic uh, friendly, okay? Uh, this is also oil friendly. So those of you who are working with oils, uh, as well as even gouache or um, watercolors, you could use synthetics, okay? As well as Bristol put this on the side. This is our palette paper, okay? So this is a nine by 12 palette pack, uh, 50 sheets, 40 pound, uh, 41 pounds of palette paper. This is what we're gonna be using when we're mixing our colors. Now this is important because palette paper almost looks like sort of a plasticky, shiny sheet of paper. This is extremely useful because instead of using a glass palette, you can just Take one up. Oop, hold on. There's this palette paper in a long time, so it's sort of drying up on one side. You can just take one off. Okay. You could attach it to whether if it's your surface. Let's do that here. Okay. This is just a counter table that I'm using. Take your uh, tape. Again, there's no right or wrong tape to use as long as it's working. And now what I like to do is sort of tape off the edge. And this is extremely important because you don't want any of your palettes to move. 
You don't want any of your paintings to spill. You do not want any of this process to get messy. Tape off some of your edges. And I have a great surface to use for my palette. So now we can get into colors. Okay. So I do have the larger, the um, 59 milli, uh, millimeters, excuse me, not milliliters, um, the containers, the two ounces uh, of the painting tubes that we're going to be using from Utrecht, from Blick. This is the more sort of simpler brand. You do not have to go buy the quality brands, guys. This is extremely depending on preference, but this is sort of the best value that you can get for the best quality. Talk a little bit about these colors. That's all I have for the Utrecht ones. And I do have a large tube of white. The white is the actual color we'll be actually using for a large tube. This is the, the eight ounce. Okay. So I first have my raw umber, my viridian green, my burnt umber, cobalt blue, yellow ochre, alizarin crimson, and burnt sienna. These are very necessary in the process of our painting. So the, when I say, oh, you know, mulch, do me a favor, add a layer of alizarin crimson, or uh, Sophia, don't forget to add in yellow ochre to the green that you just mixed. You will know what palette I'm talking about. You will understand some of those colors. And again, so whether if it's the region that you're, you're living in or the areas that you're um, around, just try to look for the actual rhetoric that's available on each tube, and the, which is also available on, on the canvas um, tabs on the supply, uh, supply list. The list is also available on the course syllabus. So just keep that in mind. Just take that into any book store and say, hey, I need these colors. They'll be able to provide that for you, okay? Let's talk a little bit about palette knives. Now, palette knives are, again, another subjective thing to think about. Here are three. Let me zoom in my camera so you guys can see this. Is the quality okay? Oh, that's really bad quality. Hold on. If I hover my hand, oh, that makes it worse. Okay. So I have three aluminum palettes, okay, in different sizes. I have a one that's a slightly skinnier, one that's a lot bigger. So if I'm moving much more paint around my canvas and one that's smaller, what's really, I've had this small one for about, I don't want to even say this because this will give my age, but around almost 15 years, about 15 years. And it's still working today. Uh, you only need one. You don't need three, okay? But these are, again, some of the ones I've picked up over the years because I was able to use in my own painting practice because I've found all of them do different jobs, okay? When I'm working with the palette paper, I actually like to use something that's thinner like this because it's easily flexible. So I can pick up some of my paint, put it on my uh, painting, and I can go from there. Here is where I'm working with a larger palette. If I'm doing a large mural on a wall that's like 20 feet wide, this is what I wanna use. And you can actually use a smaller palette here to actually build upon the texture. So if you have a lot of ink, or excuse me, a lot of paint on your surface, you can scrape it off. You can literally remove it. It's almost like it's sort of erasing the painting process. So this is, think about your palette knives as not only a mixing tool, a mixing material, but you could also remove it on your painting. Let's, let's say if you added too much paint, I would ask you of like, hey, um, Dan, don't forget to use your palette, side of your palette and remove that excess layer, remove that side of the blue so you'll be able to repaint it over again. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying use your palette wisely, okay? Any questions about palette knives? Pretty self-explanatory. Now, what I like to do is let's talk a little bit about how do we mix? This is where the fun part happens. So I'm using cobalt blue a little bit at a time. And I do have a container of water. Oh, sorry. I apologize for that. I have 
my container of water. And again, you could use any container. I like to use plastic cups or just ceramic cups, which is easier uh, just to sort of throw away a little water at a time. And I also have another one that's for glass. I like, <coughs> excuse me. I like to keep a glass of water, very, let's, I would say what, a few ounces in there and sort of keep all my brushes in there because then I'll be able to use my clean brush ready to go. So it's like easy access right next to me in terms of flexibility. But then, those of you who have taken my uh, drawing class, what is your best friend? Paper towel. Paper towel is your best friend. Why? Is because if you make any mistakes, uh, it doesn't really matter in terms of where, you could use your paper towel, you could blot it down, you could wet it to actually remove some of the paint before it dries or solidifies. This is extremely, extremely important, okay? I like to always use a paper towel at the edge of my actual paper, or excuse me, uh, my uh, palette knife uh, or my sheets of uh, palette paper that I'm gonna be using. But then also if I take my brush, I can sort of blot it on my edge here and just say, okay, my paint and uh, my brush is really clean but also dry, somewhat wet. But then if I pick up a little bit of the paint, it gets much more easier to blend, okay? But then if it's, let's say if it's too much, blot it on my sheet of paper towel, clean it on my cup. And I can use it again quickly and I can mix it rather than cross con contaminating other colors. Let's talk a little bit about that. So if I take some alizarin crimson, we're using just primaries for today. And then we're, before we get into the demo, okay? I have my cadmium yellow. These, the cadmium colors are extremely strong. And you can see how bright that is. That, it's a little dull on the camera to zoom in a little bit on my camera. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. I'm move this. Okay. Now, again, I have my container here. Keep it on my left, on my right side. What I can do is now, this is what I also like to advise students. Take your paper towel, have it in one hand whether if it's your left-handed or right-handed, okay? So if I need to clean off my palette knife, I can just swipe it off. I'm gonna take a little bit of blue, a little bit at a time. You're noticing I'm using the tip, okay? Just, I like to sort of push it on my surface of my palette knife. And I'm gonna clean the excess off my actual knife with my paper towel, just remove some of it, okay? So it's nice and clean. Add a little bit of crimson, a little bit too much. I'm gonna mix. Notice I'm flipping my palette upside down, right side up, dragging some of those paints, lifting it up, you know, pushing it down on my palette. And I get this sort of nice blood violet, which is fantastic. And this is a great dark to use for a shadow, for example. Now clean your palette knife. Do the same thing with a little bit of blue. And we'll do it over here. We'll use cobalt blue. Clean up your palette. Again, this is extremely important. Just don't forget. I'm going to zoom out slightly so we can work on this corner. Take a little bit of yellow. Okay. Mix that in there. Notice there's blotches of blue. You can lift the entire paint up and just again, put it on back onto the palette and then kind of work in circular or counter or clockwise motions, lift it up again. Again, guys, the noise outside, they're gardening. Can you guys still hear me? It's not too loud. I can hear you just fine. I can't hear you. If anybody can't, I'll close my window, sorry. Now I have a nice sort of earthier green. 
you can kind of spread it across the palette so you can kind of see what color that is. And let me actually go back and spread that violet. It's actually, that was a beautiful red, reddish blue violet. Do the same thing here. Take a little bit of cadmium yellow, put some here. Clean my palette. Again, I don't want to cross contaminate. If I had more yellow on my knife and I accidentally went to my blue, I mixed it to the blue. Same thing to my crimson red. Take a little bit of red. Remember, a little bit goes a long, a long way. And those of and those of you who ever taken like a pastry class or like or into baking, you'll know when you're using a palette knife how fluid it is when you're using some of the paints. So you almost feel like you're spreading the actual pigment onto that surface. Okay, you know what? I can't even hear myself. Give me one second. Let me close my windows. That was loud. I didn't even hear myself. Okay, I apologize, everybody. But then now, let's say, for example, so now my paper towel is slightly uh, dirty. I can use the sort of edges, all this to clean that off. Put my palette knife in my container. I'm going to throw that away. And you'll probably go over five sheets of paper towel every painting session. So keep that in mind. But then now, Let's talk a little bit about dilution. Now, when I'm diluting paint, and this is also another thing, I'm not, again, I have my paper towel here on the bottom. I'm not really um, gonna be working too much with mediums, but if I add a little bit of water, say for example here, camera slightly closer. Add a little bit of water, you can see the viscosity or the thickness and thinness of my paint becomes much more easy to, uh, to sort of uh, uh, bend and sort of flex within some of those uh, qualities of the paint. So you can be able to blend and sort of see how the brush stroke moves across the surface. Okay. But then if I add a little bit more water, it almost becomes like a watercolor. And this is something interesting to think about because it, let's say in the preliminary draft of our paintings, we're working with a thin wash. So if I say, for example, um, mulch, do me a favor, add a layer, a thin layer of red onto that side of the painting, you'll know what I'm talking about because you are diluting some of the paint with water, which is your primary medium. And this is what I mean when I say add a layer of red or add a layer of blue, add a layer of the violet and the viridian, uh, excuse me, the cadmium yellow to the green and then so on and so forth. And you'll know what I mean because you'll be able to see uh, some of the areas of the painting. Let's say for example, if this area is dry from the left and this area is still wet, I will tell you, oh, go to the dry side of your painting and add a layer of blue. Do not do it on the wet side because you need that layer to dry. That's another thing to consider, okay? Now, Clean my brush. Again, this is still my palette. So what I can do also, for example, if I take a little bit of the blue and I'm gonna mix it here. If I clean that up, take a little bit of my yellow, mix it here. Clean my brush. Again, I don't want to cross contaminate. This is where I see a lot of students having the difficulty when they forget about cleaning their brush. Take a little bit of my red. And now you get a thin wash of a brown. When you mix all three primaries, what color do you get? You get a dark brown, okay? So those of you who do not want to purchase your burnt umber, burnt sienna, or even your raw umber, you can actually make an umber, 
okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. You can make a brown. But what happens if we now apply it to our canvas paper? Let's do that. Move some of my palettes. And this is something you don't want to do, but obviously because of the demo, so you have a little bit more space. But in case of an emergency, let's say for example, if you need to move your surface or your palette, you can, because everything's taped. It's almost easier to flex some of those areas because you'll be able to move it anywhere you want. Just be careful that, again, painting is going to be a somewhat messy process. So if you are wearing good clothes or clean clothes, try to wear, <laughs> wear the, uh, the most sort of non-valuable clothing you can so you don't have to get your, your expensive clothes dirty. I personally do not care because all of my clothes are some sort of <laughs> paint or charcoal on them which is fine by me. But if you don't want to get your things dirty, something to consider. So I just moved my actual palette. So now I have my canvas pad right next to me. Okay, zoom out. So I do have now both of them right next to me. I'm gonna move hover over to my canvas paper. Okay, and now we can start the demo. How are we doing on time? Oh, perfect. So then now I'm going to pull up, again, you do not have to do this if you don't want to, obviously, but those of you who have questions or concerns about um, when we're following along in this process, you'll know what I mean when I say, okay, this is the object on this side. Move. Already. So again, we're using that image for our actual reference. And again, guys, so I won't be able to see you, but just let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Okay. How do we start? Ideally, this is where it gets really interesting. You want to add a dead layer. And one of the really great colors to use is a, a burnt umber, or you could actually use a burnt sienna. And the reason why we would like to use this is because these actually become a great neutralizing base, a warm sort of hue, warm sort of color to work with when we're applying colors over other layers of paint, okay? So what I like to do is sort of use, I'm gonna go back to the palette, and then again, we'll sort of switch uh, between each picture plane and each camera. I'm gonna add a layer of the burn number. We're gonna use the burnt upper just for the sake of the demo. Okay. I'm gonna take, let's see, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use the Bristol brush now just to sort of swap out the material so you have the idea that you could use multiple brushes. Okay. I'm gonna sort of dilute this with water. Again, what I mean by that is I'm sort of diluting this with water, meaning mixing it with water making it nice and thin. I can do this with my palette knife, but just for the sake of using a different brush, a Bristol brush instead of a synthetic, you'll see that it holds a lot more paint on my surface rather than going back and forth from my palette to my actual um, canvas, okay? Just a slight zoom out, okay? But then now, let's say for example, if I'm, again, I'm not worrying about any details. I'm just trying to figure out my composition in this preliminary draft. What I now can do is start to see, like for example, okay, that's my top. Right about here is my bottom. Here is my left, which is slightly. And then here is my right, okay? And you can kind of see the generic way of terms of looking at it very, very um, abstractly, okay? And then now, if I take more water, dilute that even further, 
this almost becomes like a watercolor effect. And what I mean by this is that you'll start to see, let's say for example, here is the plant, okay, right about here. Here is that little vase. Here's that decanter. Notice it's going over, which is completely okay. Here is the top of the decanter. Here are the eucalyptus branches, very abstract. And I'm actually gonna crop some of that extra right side of the edge. Here is the plane of where that platform is. Here's the glass. And here's that uh, rose quartz stone. Here's the muddler. Let's take a little bit of water. Okay. And I'm just figuring out my composition at this stage. Now I'm going over some of those objects. Again, I'm not worrying about any detail. This is the vase of the pot. Flipping over my brush, working from the center here and going upwards. Okay. I'm gonna dilute that even further. It's really abstract at this stage, which is what I want because I can be able to make my mistakes now. And then if I go back, I can fix some of those areas later, okay? There's that trait right about there. Here's the bottom here. And then the rest of it, for example, now I'm gonna add one prime, uh, I'm actually gonna mix, mix a little bit of the blue with the violet. Oh, and then be careful, you don't want your actual painting or your palette to dry up. You can add a little bit more water on the palette. I'm gonna start adding some darks. Okay, any questions about this process so far? This is just sort of mapping out my composition. This is, again, one way of doing it. I'm now gonna add some dark. This is a violet blue. Again, it's really uh, abstract in these stages, guys, because you are not worrying about any detail. We're not worrying about any sort of um, refined areas of the painting. We're just looking at the composition so far. Going around the rose quartz, bringing out that shadow. Going around that goblet. underneath the shadow of the muddler. My drapery. I'm gonna add a little bit of the brown to the violet just to kind of get a nice sort of blend of the two. Again, it's very abstract. I know sometimes students get uh, slightly worried in this process. Do not be worried, it's okay. You're doing the right thing, trust me. Use the side of my brush. Okay, now it's getting much more refined from that candle holder. Clean my brush. Water that down even further. Sorry, I'm flicking, <laughs> I'm accidentally hitting my camera. So if it does move, that's me doing that, I apologize. And notice, I mean, I don't know if you guys can tell, my canvas paper is starting to buckle. 
And this is something to consider because you, you should ideally tape the edges, but just for the sake of the demo, you don't have to because then you'll be able to go back and actually wait when it fully dries, it becomes flat. But since it's canvas, obviously when you get into your 18 by 24 inch canvas, uh, stretch pre-stretched canvas, um, when you get to the actual painting, the final painting, uh, it will be a lot easier to sort of work much more roughly because you can add, actually apply more pressure. Okay, now I'm gonna add. I'm gonna add some blues. Let's add some blues to these colors, shall we? I'm gonna go over the vase because I know that that vase is white, but what I'm doing is sort of a, creating a wash for the white because when I go over it with white, it'll be a nice cooler tone. So I'm gonna add some blue over this to kind of fill that in. It's really watery, which is perfect. Same thing with that transparent glass that, uh, what is it called, uh, decanter. Go over that with the slight variation of the blue. Notice it's going over that violet because this area is a light, slightly darker. But notice the darker, the more layers I add, the more sort of darker it becomes. So when I go back, back and add some of the uh, rich alizarin crimson, you get that beautiful blood red, which is fantastic. Add a little bit more blue on this side. And again, when you mix a little bit of blue and the brown, you get a nice, beautiful, rich black. Okay, now that image is starting to come up. What about my muddler? Bottom of the muddler here more of a shadow. Notice that shadow becomes almost pitch black, which is fantastic. But I also need to add just a little bit of the blue on top of the glass because you want that sort of reflective quality. Again, that's the goblet down here. Very abstractly, very loosely, not worrying about detail. This is where a lot of students fall into that detail sort of trap. Okay, a lot of them work with a smaller brush, for example, and kind of work in this sort of manner, very refinedly, like very slowly. That is not the way that I want you guys to work. And one of the reasons why is because of time. Time, as my veterans will know, is probably the most crucial aspect of any assignment. Okay, and during the quarter, I don't want you to be wasting it just on the details, because that's not how we can start to look at the paint much more legibly. Here's the base of the goblet. It's much more wider at this base here. Maybe it's much more refined here. I'm gonna wait for that area to dry, but also did my eucalyptus. And instead of draw, uh, painting each eucalyptus, I'm just making some marks. Because obviously the eucalyptus is looks more of a bluish green, but when I go over it, it gets much more interesting. But then also some of my green, coolish, uh, what's the name of this plant? Uh, snake plant or a mother tongue plant. I think that that's what it's called. And then now if I take my brush and sort of clean off some of the, the, the actual paint, um, onto the brush, and I actually now I can go back and blend in some of those colors while it's still wet. And this is a great process to work from when you're now thinking about what to do next. Now, if I add a little bit of cobalt blue and brown, a ratio of 50 50, you get a nice black which is fantastic, which is actually what I want. And that should be around about here. You can see how dark that is, right? That gradual sort of illusion of sort of shadows in the background. There's more here. And it's okay if I go over those layers that I added underneath, because I'm gonna go over it again. This is not in the uh, painting sort of form, uh, excuse me, this is not in the drawing format. Remember, we are painting, we are understanding the language of painting. You, tr you need to use a brush instead of a pencil. 
in these preliminary drawings. And what I mean by drawings is the preliminary sketch of our painting. You want to really just kind of get in that mindset of using a brush instead of a pencil, because if we make mistakes, we can go back and fix it by just working over it, not erasing. Is that dark? That candle. I'm actually going to darken the whole thing and I'm going to add a light on top of it just for the sake of the demo. So you can see how that reflects. And now I'm going to go around some of my objects to kind of make it slightly darker. And I want that illusion. I want that illusion of space, that sort of depth between the richness of those colors, the richness of those deep blues and browns to so make my nice sort of base of my black. And I don't want to use black because the black will actually make my image flat. You do not want that. I want to have fun in this process to kind of really be experimental. Remember, think of yourself almost like a scientist to say what colors worked well together. How, what happens if I add a yellow? What happens if I add a blue or a reddish orange? How is that going to re react to the rest of the colors? And I noticed there's texture. There's that sort of plaid texture onto my, uh, my surface. So, but I also need to recognize where it is. This is the perspective of the muddler. The base of that decanter, which is almost black on the side, but it's almost a blood black. So I need to remember that. Now I don't want to add too much blue because I don't want it to look what? Cool. We started what at 11.04 for the demo for the painting. This is what 11.20, so it's not that long. You really want to take your time. It should take a few minutes, probably no more than 30 to make your first layer. The, the next part it would be to wait for the area to dry, but just for the sake of the demo, I'm gonna continue because we're working with acrylics and they have a tendency to dry much more fast, which is fantastic. I don't have to sort of worry about areas within the drawing or excuse me, areas of the, the preliminary painting that I need to focus too much on. This is that rose quartz. I need to keep sort of light because I don't want to actually add too much dark. I want it to kind of pop on my painting. I want it to kind of reflect the light instead of have it sort of dull. Now, I know it's a little bit more difficult to see, but I have my white container, which I'm going to add white now after, uh, after what I'm about to talk, uh, talk about. I have my wooden candle holder, my muddler, my rose quartz object, my goblet, and then the rest of the eucalyptus, okay? At this stage, it took about, what, a few minutes? I'm gonna now take my brush, again, clean it off. All that excess paint comes off. Again, your best friend, which is your paper towel. Now, let's add some white. Just grab some of my tube. This is where it gets almost the magic happens. Okay. I'm going to take this brush, smaller brush. I'm going to switch to synthetic. I'm just going to clean off some of those edges of the tip of the painting. I have some white. I'm going to actually blend in. I'm going to add a little bit of the blue brown, a little bit, like a, probably a ratio of. 10 to 90, 90% white, 10% blue brown. Okay, and I'm gonna slightly now go over that base with a wash. Again, when I say wash or a layer, it's a thin down paint, 
media. Move it across. And this is where the more refined areas of the painting will take a little bit more time. Add a little bit of water, sort of make that come through the painting, fill that in. Now I have my composition. I'm sorry, that's my coffee machine. I apologize. And then now, I'm going to take some of my, uh, my brush start to just sort of refine that edge. Just you know, that's my composition. I'm actually taking up some of that paint off because my, my brush is slightly drier, which is okay. I don't want it too wet. If I take some raw white, Add a little bit of yellow, just the hair, and a little bit of the blue. Now this almost becomes like a 95 ratio. Blend some of this color together. Give me one second. Let's add a little bit more white. Can now add. You can see that's a big jump, right? And you're moving the paint across. And now I'm going to wait for this area to dry. But then I can also take my fan brush. Where's my fan brush? Let me grab it. This is probably one of the best brushes that you could use to blend. What I like to do is sort of take my fingers and kind of remove any excess water. You want it to sort of be much more sort of uh, open-ended, so it'll look more like this. But then if it's still sort of being, sometimes some of the fan brush can do this, like parts of it can stick together. You just wet it, take your hand, do the sort of Bob Ross quick. Now it goes a little fast, I'll go slower. This is what I'm doing. Just kind of relieve some of that paint off. Now I can just slowly blend those areas. Oh, that looks great. And then notice I'm working from that side, moving it across. And notice I'm going in the direction of the base because I want it to look like it's blending together. If you're left-handed, do the same thing. Yeah. And now I have my pot. But then I can also take my fan brush and add a little bit more, it's very gently. It almost looks like you wanna be really fragile in this, in this process. Add a layer of the white. And I'm actually gonna go downwards. And notice it's going over that wooden uh, container, which is okay. But I want that to blend beautifully. And what I'm also gonna do is actually take some white. So I have a lot of white on there, you can see on both sides and also now blend that on top of it because I want a nice sort of crisp clean area and I don't want it to look muddy Once you slightly, gently, very gently blend that in, you get a nice sort of three-dimensional base. But 
but then now I'm going to refine some of my edges because it went over. I'm going to take my brush, clean it. This is uh, synthetic brush number 16. So it's just a refined with a little bit of water. Any questions so far? And this almost becomes like the final areas of the painting later on when I go back because I need to, for that to dry before I get into another layer. But then now, while that's still wet, take my brush but it's slightly more. Notice that edge here. That edge here. And then I'm also gonna take a little bit of blue. This is a thick layer to darken that shadow. This is the top of the base. And the bottom. I'm coming around the base. This is that bluish brown that we made. I'm going around the edge. This is almost the sort of the quiet part of the painting process. You want to take your time to refine the edge. Okay. And then now here, go upwards. And I know this is my decanter right about here, but I'm gonna come around there. But then now, get into the greens. So I'm gonna add some yellow, some blue, make some nice green. And I'm gonna have a more turquoisey blue at this stage, excuse me, uh, green at this stage because it will be my dark my plants. So this is that sort of color. That's right about here's that larger leaf here. Now I'm adding more color directly onto my layer. Now adding now this part, we're gonna use less medium and more paint. So you can see how the image almost comes alive. But ideally, I want that area to dry, but that's okay. Just for the sake of the demo, we'll continue. Okay, here's the plant. Now I'm gonna add some raw yellow, raw, meaning just pick up some yellow. Now refine that area. Some more yellow. Go over the green. I want that sort of light, sort of bright yellow. Because when I go over it with a little bit of blue and white, you'll see that almost becomes like a highlight. And again, I'm just dragging the paint. Remember, I'm just dragging it, meaning you have a chunk of it on your actual brush. If you start to slightly drag it, you'll be able to see it. Notice that it's, my brush is spinning. So you want to be able to drag and spin your brush at the same time. This is sort of a great way to have sort of blobs 
and thick layers of the pain. So once that's dry, I can go back and add in, for example, I'm gonna add some more red, yellow, for example, to that side of the pain. Just and you really want to, again, take your time, because what's a complementary of the red? The green. And this makes it come alive. This actually will help the balance of the color read much more legibly. Okay, let me clean this off. Now I have a really clear idea of where the base is in relationship to what? The candle, the decanter, the eucalyptus, the muddler, and so on and so forth. But then now, now let's get, let's get to something much more tricky, glass. A lot of students always have that sort of difficulty with the glass. The good rule of thumb is look at the light. Where is the light coming from? Now I notice, it's a more blue brown and majority white, but I'm gonna add a thin layer of my darker browns and blues onto my glass. Let me add just a little bit of water. So this is a more sort of ratio of blue brown. And I'm gonna slightly go around and inwards of my glass. So it's right about here some darks here and I'm just blobbing some of these areas for the dark. That sounds strange but you'll know what I need in a few minutes. Adding some darks. Actually my, my, my canvas paper is sort of rising. So, but then now what's reflected behind it is my drapery. So I'm gonna actually add some of that in. It's almost sort of a darker brown excuse me, lighter brown, a little bit, a little bit of red, more almost dull, because you want that plaid to show, but add some red, crimson red, some brown, a little bit of the green. Get my brush up. I wish I had a second camera, so I can have three cameras. I need to do that. So it's just almost putty, almost uh, beige color. It actually come around, around that white area, excuse me, the lighter area, I should say, of the goblin. But then also come around my darker blues. I just added, kind of blend in some of those areas. And again, it's very dull at this stage. But then now, things, things get much more interesting when I start adding some white. This is where it gets slightly tricky. So you want a clean brush, very, very clean. You don't want it too dirty. You want to be able to have fun with some of the whites. You just grab another paper towel. Okay. a nice clean brush, I'm gonna take some white without no medium, no medium at all, no white, no water, and actually come around the glass. And this is where it almost looks like it uh, works like a pencil, which is interesting. And ideally, I do want this area to dry, but I can go over it wet on wet which is a la prima. But you could also do dry on wet. Can we see the glass now a little bit in relationship to the reflections of what's behind? It's interesting because glass is, is something we see through. It's not an actual physical opaque object, but how we depict it is how we see light through it. But that's also depending on 
where the light is bouncing off of the object. Notice I'm not blending. I'm just moving the white on some of the edges. If I start blending, it gets too dull. The base. This is sort of the magic of white, of how you can use it with, now I'm gonna mix with color, add a little bit of blue to the white to make it much more what? Transparent. And I think this is will get really interesting. I'm just watering it down. Let me apply more color. Because I don't want to cover too much. I just want to cover enough. Also, I'm gonna add some raw blue. I need to add a little bit of violet on the bottom. And it's really within that color, sort of color relationship. Example around it, with that nice little violet around that. Add a little bit more water. Now, I want to warm it up, so I'm going to add a little bit of yellow. Yellow is your good friend. When you're using yellow ochre, it's more for the flesh and natural tones. But if you add a little bit of yellow and white, more ratio of like 80-20. 20% 20. 20 yellow, 80% white. Get a nice sort of bright. You can see that's extremely bright, which is fantastic. Now I have a great sort of base to work from. And I'm gonna wait for that area to dry, but that's where my goblet is. Did that make sense? So I'm gonna add more layers. 